When you give to our church, you not only help support missionaries through the cooperative program, but you also have the opportunity to give through the Lighty Moon Christmas offering. Every year, our church gives to this special offering in a special way through the Lottie Moon Post Office. As you get ready to send your Christmas card to a church member, rather than take it to the post office, mail it through our Lottie Moon Post Office. Your postage expenses go directly to support the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. The Lottie Moon Christmas offering is an annual offering collected by Southern Baptists to support international missions. This offering is unique from other mission offerings in that 100% of gifts provide for missionaries all over the world. It's a valuable part of Southern Baptist's 175-year history of reaching the nations with the gospel, and it's vital to reaching the vision of a multitude from every language, people, tribe, and nation, knowing and worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have Christmas cards you want to send to a church member, don't forget to send them through our Lottie Moon Post Office. Thank you for giving. Well, good morning, church family. It is good to be with you this morning. However different your Thanksgiving was this year from a normal Thanksgiving, I hope that it was for you a time of gratitude, and I'm thankful that we can worship together this morning. As those of y'all who are here in the room can tell, we have transitioned, we have shifted from a season of Thanksgiving to this season of Advent, this season of expectation and of anticipation when we look forward to the coming of Christ. There's two parts of this idea of looking forward to the coming of Christ. The first is that we look forward with the Old Testament prophets to the birth of Christ, to his first coming, which we celebrate on Christmas Day. And the second part for us is we look forward to his second coming when we will see the final fulfillment of those promises which his birth, his death, and his resurrection, resurrection began to fulfill. So I'm grateful that this Sunday and the next three Sundays we can celebrate this season of Advent together when we can reflect upon the hope and the peace and the joy and the love which are ours in Christ. Visually, the way that we do this is through the lighting of the Advent candles here at this wreath at the front. At the beginning of each service over the next four Sundays, we'll light one of these candles to remind us of one of these core Advent virtues. And so this morning, on this, the Advent Sunday of hope, I want to invite Jorge and Michelle and Adeline Rivera to come forward and light for us the Advent candle of hope. Thank you to the Riveras. This is a morning of hope. This is a season of hope. And our hope is found in Christ and Christ alone. So let's stand together and begin to sing about the hope which is ours in Christ. And I hope that you'll join me now in a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this season. God, we thank you for the hope which is ours in Christ. Thank you that in a world that can be difficult, in a world that can be cold, in a world that can even be cruel, we find our hope in Christ. That during this season, we can reflect upon that time when the hopes of your people were fulfilled, not with some sweeping military victory, not with some grand political gesture, but with the birth of a baby boy. Lord, in this season, we draw hope from that birth. We draw hope from the coming of Emmanuel, God with us. So Lord, be with us in this time as we worship. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. We'll continue singing here in just a moment. But before we do so, I want to introduce and read to you this morning's scripture. The title of 
this sermon series, which we'll be in for the next four Sundays, is the fifth gospel, which is a nickname that goes back to the days of the early church for the prophet Isaiah and for the book of Isaiah. For indeed, in that book, we find many, many references to the Christ, this one who would come to save his people. We find this vision of a world which is made right through the coming of the Messiah. So we'll be in the book of Isaiah for each of the next four Sundays. And I want to read to you now from the 64th chapter of that book, the first nine verses. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned, and you hid yourself as we transgressed. We've all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us in the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God for it. If you have your Bible this morning, you've heard the scripture already. Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. I invite you to turn there so that you can follow along throughout the message. I want to begin by showing you a flower that I came across this week in getting ready for this message. Enothera biennis. Enothera biennis, better known as the evening star, the sun drop, the German rampion, the king's cure-all, the hogweed, which I have to imagine if you were the flower, that's the one you would least prefer to be called, or most commonly, the evening primrose. The evening primrose. It's a flower that's native to eastern and central North America, from Newfoundland west to Alberta, southeast to Florida, and even southwest down here to our own state, to Texas. It's edible, but not all that tasty. It can be used medicinally, but it doesn't seem to do all that much good. For the most part, it's simply an ornamental flower. Nice one to put in the garden, pretty to look at. But what does make this flower unique? What brought it to my attention this week was how it grows and from where it gets that name, the evening primrose. Because if you were to look at this flower during its two years of life, during the daytime, you will find it closed up. Not until dusk does it begin to blossom. The evening primrose only blooms in the darkness. Hope often works the same way. When things are going well, when things are in a happy state, you don't need hope, or so it seems. When everything is right in the world, you can just look at your circumstances, just look at how things are, and you feel 
fine. It's in the darkness that hope really starts to blossom. In our scripture this morning, Isaiah chapter 64, this third section of the book of Isaiah, we find the prophet speaking to a people who have been dealing with darkness for quite some time. The people of Judah had just returned from a period of exile, just returned from a time in which they had been carried off from their own land to a foreign nation, made to live by that nation's laws and customs. They were strangers in a strange land. But finally, the day had come when the decree had gone out from the emperor Cyrus that the people could return home, that they could go back to the holy city of Jerusalem, that they would still be under the rule of the empire, under the rule of Persia, but they could go back to their own place. They could live by their own ways. They could worship their own God. And so they returned. But even upon return, even with the exile ended, they found that they were still in darkness. They came back to Jerusalem, and it was not the city of David and Solomon. It still lay mostly in ruins. Solomon's temple had been sacked long ago, and they didn't have the resources to rebuild it. In this same time, seemingly every year, a drought would come, a natural disaster would come, a plague would come, and all the while, they were having to pay this heavy yearly tribute to Persia. They remained dominated by a foreign nation. God's people remained in darkness, even as they came back home. But it's in this time of darkness, in this period of difficulty that hope began to blossom. Because the prophet, as recorded here in this third section of the book of Isaiah, the prophet brings word after word after word after word about a time which is coming soon when God will set things right. When God will bring about restoration when God will put things back together again. And chapter after chapter, verse after verse, we get these words of hope. This hope which blossoms in the darkness. This year, perhaps there's a word in that for us. That in times of darkness... Hope can blossom. So let's look here at the passage. Isaiah chapter 64. When we hope in the darkness, perhaps the first thing that we are hoping for as people of God is simply for God's intervention. For God to step into our situation and for us to know his presence. For God to show up in our time of distress. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, praised the prophet. When you read through these first few verses of the chapter, what really kind of strikes the imagination, what really catches your attention, is all of this very vivid nature imagery about the mountains quaking, at the presence of God, about the how as fire kindles brushwood and fire causes water to boil, so too does the word and the presence of God. 
when you did awesome deeds that we didn't expect, the mountains quaked, reminds the prophet. We get all this imagery about how when God shows up, the whole world shakes at his presence. Make no mistake what the main point is here, though. It's not about the mountains. It's not about the world shaking. It's about God showing up. It's a reminder that in days past, God was there for his people. It's a reminder that in the good times and the bad times, God did not abandon his people. And that over and over and over again, when things looked the bleakest, God showed up for his people. God has come down before, the prophet reminds the people, and his hope is that God will do so again. Here in just a second, I want to put an image up on the screen that for those of y'all who are Texas Longhorn fans, this is going to be a good few minutes for you. Uh, if you're Aggie fans, you had a good weekend, so just you're going to have to bear with me. Um, you've got enough good things going on in your life. And if you're a Baylor fan like me, I mean, basketball season just started, so <laughs> that's something. All right, Chad, go ahead and put the image up there. We're going to talk about this for a few minutes. Um, this is a picture from the 2006 Rose Bowl when University of Texas beat USC and won the national championship. Who, who watched that game when it was on? It was a pretty big one, so I suspect even those of you with your hands up were made aware of it by friends, friends and neighbors. It was a pretty good game. Okay, I'm not a UT fan, but I watched the game, and it's one of the most memorable that I've ever seen. For one thing, it was an upset by the University of Texas. USC was favored by seven points going into the game. They'd won the national championship the year prior, and not only did they have that year's Heisman winner on their starting roster, they had the previous year's Heisman winner on their roster. So coming into the game, many a Longhorn fan was hoping for a good showing hoping for a good game, but I talked to enough of them before that game that I knew that in their heart of hearts, they weren't expecting to win. But the guy in the picture, Vince Young, starting quarterback for the Longhorns, had something else to say about that. Threw for 267 yards passing in that game. And at the time that this picture was taken, he had rushed for 200 yards and three touchdowns, including the one pictured. The game was significant because while I'm told there were 11 Longhorns on the starting offense, it did not feel like it when you were watching the game. It really felt like it was the Vince Young show and he was the only person on the field who mattered. That had been the story for most of the year for the Texas Longhorns. He finished second in the Heisman race that year, and again and again and again, when things were looking rough for the Longhorns, Vince Young would step in and rattle off a 60-yard run or a 40-yard pass and would resurrect the team's hopes. So I remember when we came to this moment that you see pictured. 19 seconds to go in the game, Longhorns down by less than a touchdown. Fourth down, five yards. Last play for the Texas offense. Step back into the pocket, surveyed his receivers, didn't see anybody open, and took off running. Now, I cannot stress to you enough, I am not a Longhorns fan. Just that night. Just that night. But I had seen enough Texas games that year. 
that when he took off running, I knew with certainty he was going to make it to the end zone. I'd seen it too many times before to doubt. I'd watched too many comeback victories. I'd watched him do the impossible too many times that year. When he took off running, I knew that victory was imminent. All right, Chad, take, take that down. <laughs> Ugh, I just feel sick right now. Um, church family. The prophet writes about God and how time and time again the people saw him at work. How time and time again when things looked dark God showed up. Just like in that game, even with Texas behind, even with this being the last chance, I knew that Vince Young would make it into the end zone. In dark times, the prophet reminds us that God has come down before and he will do so again. In this season, we celebrate the fulfillment of that hope. The prophet hoped that God would show up in his people's time of need. The prophet prayed that God would come down and be with his people. One night in Bethlehem, God did just that. A baby born to a virgin revealed to us that no matter the darkness, God is with us. Verse 5 reminds us here that God does that. He comes down. He arrives. He intervenes. But the prophet makes a distinction here in the fifth verse. He says, he got, that he says that God meets those who do right. But, he says, but we sinned. You hid yourself because we transgressed. The story takes a turn here for the prophet. He has celebrated those times in the past when God came down. When God intervened in the affairs of his people. But now, the prophet says, we are in a state of corporate sinfulness. We have strayed from what you have called us to. And because of that, the prophet says, you have hid your face. It's a tough state to be in. And so the prophet can only pray, can only hope for a time in which things will be different. In verses 8 and 9, he says, Do not be angry, O Lord, and do not remember our iniquity forever. Consider that we are your people. The prophet acknowledges the sinfulness of God's people. But he prays, he hopes for God's mercy. Remember the first time that I ever got pulled over for speeding, I was, let's see, I would have been 18 years old. And it was a day in, I want to say April, March, April, somewhere around then. And we had just finished doing what was then called the tax test, what's now the star test. And so, because of that, didn't have a lot going on. And so, in fact, my first period classes had been canceled because of 
for the test, and we were told we didn't have to show up to school until a little bit later. So I got to get to school at like 10.30 that morning. It was a great day. Or so I thought, until I was working my way up Centerville, headed to downtown Garland, and I had music playing pretty loud, as I often did in those days. And so maybe my adrenaline was up a little too high. Maybe I was just enjoying the beautiful sunny day. I, I don't know why, but I was not going 40 miles per hour. I was not going 45 miles per hour. I was not going 50 miles per hour. According to the officer, I was going 57 miles per hour in that 40 mile per hour zone. So, for the first time in my life, saw the flashing lights, heard the siren behind me, and so heart rate immediately jumped up, pulled over, and the officer came to talk to me at the window. He asked if I knew how fast I'd been going. I said, I don't think I was going 40. Uh, and he assured me I was not. And he let me know how fast I was going. He asked if I'd ever been pulled over before. I don't know if I was sweating or what. He could see it in my eyes. I told him, no, this, this, was, this was my first time. And I remember looking at him. I remember the expression on his face and the look in his eyes as he went back to the car and wrote me a ticket. Because that's how it usually works in the world. When you do something wrong, you pay the penalty. That's how it works. That's what's fair. That's what's just. When you do what is wrong, punishment is the result. We live in a hard world. And so there are times when it feels like you're just enduring punishment after punishment after punishment, judgment after judgment after judgment, when it feels like you just can't catch a break. And you wonder, can mercy be found in this world? God's answer to that question began in Bethlehem. His answer continued in the villages of Galilee and Judea. And he answered the question once and for all on a cross just outside Jerusalem. If you're looking for mercy in this world, I don't know that you'll find it. But if you look for mercy in the arms of the Father, if you look for mercy in the Word made flesh, if you look for mercy in the Holy Spirit, there's mercy to be found. During this season, during this year, we hope for God's intervention. We hope also for his mercy. And in Christ, we find our hope fulfilled. One last thing. That appeal for mercy from the prophet. When you read it closely, it's interesting what he appeals to about God when he's asking for mercy. He doesn't say, Lord, have mercy on us because we deserve it. He doesn't point back to past good deeds of the people. He doesn't say, Lord, have mercy on us because, sure, we've sinned here and there, but we're, we're bringing our offerings every week. He doesn't say, Lord, have mercy on us because we're still doing our best to serve you. He doesn't appeal to fairness doesn't say, Lord, it's only fair that you cut us some slack this time. He doesn't try to bargain. No. 
when the prophet asks for God's mercy, this is what he says. Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are the work of your hands. And in the last words of verse 9, we are your people. What the prophet appeals to is not fairness, is not merit, but is relationship. What he appeals to is the covenant God had made so many years ago with his people. What the prophet places his hope in is the faithfulness of God. Those of y'all who are on committees here at the church have learned over the last year and a half that if I can get a committee meeting scheduled any time except a weeknight, I will take that opportunity. If we can do it on a Sunday afternoon, I'd rather do that than 7 o'clock on a weeknight. If we can do it at 6 in the morning, I'd rather do that than 7 o'clock on a weeknight. That's because I've got two small kids. So 6.30 to 8, roughly, that's bedtime. That's when Lindsay and I get the chance to do baths with the kids, reading books with the kids, tuck them in, give them their kiss goodnight, call it an evening. A few weeks ago, there was a night where we did have a committee meeting of some sort, and I needed to be up here at about 7 o'clock. And so I made sure to warn Andrew beforehand, let him know that I wasn't going to be there that night to give him his bath, wasn't going to be there to read books and tuck him in, kiss him goodnight. So I'll, I'll see you in the morning. I'm not going to be here tonight for bedtime. And for whatever reason, this wasn't the first time I told him something like this before. For whatever reason, it, it stuck in his craw on this particular night. He said, Daddy, you have to. You have to be here for bedtime. I said, well, but I, I can't. I'll be here when you wake up in the morning, and I'll be here tomorrow night and the night after that and the night after that. I said, I, I can't be here for bedtime tonight. And he looked really stern, looked me in the eye and said, you're my daddy. You have to be here. I can't help but think that the prophet here, with perhaps prettier language, maybe a little less defiantly, is saying the same thing to Almighty God. You're our Father. You have to be with us. We're in covenant relationship. You have to be there for us. You love us. You have to be there for us. It's in this season that we celebrate the fact that God heard that message. And that just like I did when Andrew talked to me, God smiled. And on that night in Bethlehem, God kept his promise. God sent Jesus. God sent Emmanuel. God with us. And God remained faithful to his promises. The prophet had reminded the Lord, we are your people. You are the potter. We are are the clay. We are the work of your hands. And with the birth of Jesus, the Lord agreed. God is faithful. This year, plenty of darkness to go around. Plenty of 
doubts, plenty of fears, plenty of anxieties that we've all been sharing for, what is it, nine months now? Plenty to be worried about. In this season, perhaps hope can, can blossom, hope can bloom in the darkness. In this season, we can hope for God's intervention and for God's presence. And we can remember that our God is with us. We can hope for God's mercy. And we can remember that our God is merciful. We can hope for God's faithfulness. And we can remember that our God is faithful still. May the coming of Christ, may the fulfillment of the prophet's hopes, may they bring you hope in this season of Advent. And as we look forward to the day when we will no longer see in a mirror dimly, but instead we'll see face to face, when we will know God fully even as we have been fully known. When we will see the world set right, as we look forward to that day, as we anticipate that day, as we expect that second advent, may you be filled with the hope of Christ. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for what you did so many years ago. I thank you that you sent us your son. That the hopes and fears of all the years were met that very night. I thank you, Lord, that the prayers of the prophet did not go unanswered, but that they were heard and that they were fulfilled. Lord, as we offer up our own prayers in this season, as we too ask for your intervention, as we too ask for your mercy, as we too ask for your faithfulness, I pray, Lord, that we would see our hopes fulfilled. Be with us, our God, our Father. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. Our hopes were fulfilled in a little town called Bethlehem as the king of kings was laid in a manger bed. So let's stand together and sing that beloved carol, Away in a Manger. just a moment, we'll move into a time of church conference to take care of a little bit of church business. I also want to remind you that there are a lot of announcements right now related to 
this season. So if you didn't see those before the service, stick around and we'll have those playing after church conference. They're also on the live stream. Plenty to learn about, plenty to see about, more than you want me to announce here from the pulpit right now. But before we move into our time of church conference, let me just offer you this word of benediction to close our time of worship. When you long for God's presence, may the coming of Emmanuel bring hope. When the world feels cold and cruel, may the mercy of the Lord bring hope. When promises go unkept and you are abandoned, may the faithfulness of the Savior bring hope. In days when bad news threatens to overwhelm, may you be blessed by the good news that hope has a name. And so in his name, in Jesus' name, go 